It's August 9th, 2021. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode 134 of Rook. Hope you are keeping well, wherever you're tuning in from around the world. Salam, Dustan Aziz. Moi var hastab ki khub va mizun bashin. Hello to you from Toronto, Canada. Welcome to one of our special themed episodes of Rook this month. Hi, Groovy Shaya. Hi, Aziz. At the turntables. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're focusing on the champions, three remarkable humans of Iranian descent, all of them women who have been champions in their respective sports. The kickboxer Farina Zalari in Vancouver, the karate queen Nassim Varaste in Toronto, and the wrestling champ Afsun Roshan Zamir Johnston in San Diego. That's all coming up. We are coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms and where you can become a patron of our program and support us just press the support us button in the red in the right hand corner on the main page rookmedia.com we're on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of iranian diaspora identity we can be found on spotify soundcloud apple podcast cast box and if you'd like to see some visuals with rook and see us on social media switch over to youtube right now or instagram at rook media and if you like your rook descriptions and bulletins in english and persian check us out on telegram all right let's get to our guests this is a special themed episode of rook i'm Gian gomeshi and this is the champions first guest is one of those rare daredevils in our world, whether facing up to a challenger in the ring or challenging the brute force of a patriarchal state. She's never backed out of a fight and has always given as good as she's received. Fadinoz Lari was the first Iranian woman to win the World Kickboxing Championships in 2013. After her win, Canadian officials, who knew she'd lived in Vancouver as a permanent resident since 2010, approached her to ask whether she would switch teams. Officials in Iran appeared to be supportive, but after Fadinoz landed in Canada and applied to switch over, she received a letter of suspension. The tone of the letter made it sound as though she might have been acting as a spy. A second suspension, which prevented Fadinoz from fighting with the Canadian kickboxing team for a year and a half, ended in 2017. She's currently the 52 kilogram world number five ranked contender. She's had an incredible journey of perseverance against all odds that has led her to Canada where she now runs a gym and is part of the Canadian national kickboxing team. Fadi Nazalari joins us from Vancouver, British Columbia. Hello, Fadi Naz. Hi. It's very nice to have you on this program. I'm Um, honored to be on. You know, your story is not the average tale of the first generation (laughs) migrant, you know, faced with insurmountable obstacles in pursuing your passion in Iran. You had to make a conscious choice of abandoning the, gl- the glory of representing Iran in international arenas to start this completely new life in Canada and join the Canadian team. Obviously, that must have been an excruciating decision. Have you ever looked back with regret at that? Not at all. Um, I'd say and when I first moved to Canada, it was my family's decision. They applied uh, for immigration many years back. And then by the time it was approved, I was already graduated from university and I already had a a good spot in the national team and I was on my way to the top. So the first few years, I would say three or four years that I was in Canada, I would still go back and forth because my training and my team was back home. And so it was a little bit of a challenge having to travel and not being able to settle. 
Um, but when I reached my uh, reached the point of uh, world championships, and when I saw how they would typically work with the men and how they would appreciate the male athletes compared to a female athlete that was the first ever to win a world championship. Uh, so when I won it, there was no man or women who've ever won it. So right. it was a first right. for all of us. And how what the reaction that I got and how disappointed they were because they wanted the men to they almost uh, they almost didn't the they medal. don't they almost didn't publicize it right is that correct no all so the all the publications to be honest happened through social media the social media scene was picking up and and that's how people found out because every year at the end of the Persian year they do this athlete appreciation night and then they would invite them and give them gifts etc. And then what they did is they they didn't invite me, and they invited all the men, wow. even though they didn't medal. And at that time, all these things would make me angry and frustrated, and, and I still wanted to prove myself. But then when I got the invitation to be in the Canadian team, it was kind of a relief for me because I felt like even though I haven't achieved anything in Canada, this, this is a country that appreciates my um, work and appreciates all I've done. You know, I was thinking about you and thinking about, um, I was thinking about wearing the flag of a country when you're competing, especially at that elite level, winning medals, etc. It's such a big declaration. Like I can't even, I'm not sure I can even think of something that is similar to that in terms of how big a declaration it makes and what kind of a symbol you become of that place. And you became this champion representing Iran. Now you represent Canada and you live and work in Vancouver. How do you sort out your own identity? How can you identify what feels like home? You know, I'm very grateful for Canada because you are right. That the biggest achievement is for Iran. And I will never forget the moment that I stood on the podium and they raised the flag and the national anthem was going and my whole body was shaking. It was the most, I would say, amazing feeling of my life. But Canada is, I'm so grateful for because they understand your background. They accept you for who you are. They don't expect you to lose your identity and be this person that they want you to be and say what they want you to say. So they appreciate what I have and what I bring and all the experience. And I am still, you know, the girl that comes from Iran. But at the same time, I have my own place. I'm valued here. It's not just that they didn't celebrate you or invite you to, to those kind of celebrations. You were sanctioned then by Iran and prevented from performing in the sport you love for four years. How do you channel the anger and heartbreak you must have felt? So what happened was after the 2013 World Championships, I was invited to compete for Team Canada because I was already residing in Canada. My training was mostly there. So it would have made so much more sense. I was a permanent resident about to become a citizen. So what the, the officials of Iran did, they acted like it's uh, okay and, and they approved. But then uh, I went back and so for kickboxing, uh, world championships is every two years. So for two years, I assumed that I'm uh, going to compete for Canada and I trained. Uh, I even sent all my information. Uh, the, the federation bought my ticket and booked the hotel and reserved my spot and everything like that. And it was almost 10 or 14 days before leaving for the competition when I was served with a letter saying that I'm suspended because I never legally asked for the change. And by law, I can they can uh, suspend me for two years. And, and that was the most amazing years of my life because I was uh, 26, 27, I was at my prime and, and I had this motivation to, to prove myself to a country that I live in now. And then that two years was so frustrating because I felt like, you know, nobody can help me. It's, it's a process that I have to endure. But I definitely feel like I use that frustration in training. And that, that fueled me to become better. And I felt like even though I can't compete and show my skills, I can still improve on them and become better. So once those two years was done, I, I applied again. And they said they never received the letter. So they were trying to play this game of losing documents in order to wait for my years to be done. They even, I've heard that they've, they've said, why is she still trying to compete? She should stay home and raise children. So it's, I feel like who they, did they, they who did to they say prolong that, to? that. Where, where did they say that? 
Um, they said that to another male athlete that was in uh, the national team of Iran. There was basically a question of uh, what's going on with her situation, and and they kind of discarded it as in, you know, uh, let her, you know, circle around with this period of time, and then eventually she'll get tired and give up. Good Lord. Hey, when, when, yeah. when you talk about channeling your frustrations when, when you're in the sport, do you mean you actually think about these things like while you're fighting or you, or, or no, or are you thinking about technique? Like in the moment, what's in your head? When you are in the ring, you are definitely thinking about all the tactics that you and your coach to work on. But because kickboxing is a sport that is, I would say it's beautiful and it's technical, but there is still that sense of aggression. So there is still something that there's, I would say, a fire that you need to lit in order to be able to channel everything in. So I would say, yes, the first time I went back in the ring, I was thinking about that before I started. Mm. They even, what they did at the time, my husband was still with the national team of Iran, and um, I was trying to fight for Canada, and they even um, threatened saying that if I fight for Canada, they won't let him compete for Team Iran anymore. So they even went above that in order to create a, a huge issue in my personal life. Wow. Where, where, where do you find the inner strength to persevere? What, what is it about Fiery Noahs? Like, where did this come from in you, do you think? To be fair, I've never had a, a rough childhood. I had a good childhood. I, my family was great, and they, they've always done everything uh, for us to, you know, have the best life possible. So I would say it, it mostly comes from trying to be the best version of myself. And sometimes in order to be that, you have to endure pain. <laughs> as I mean, like physical pain. But I, I always think that all these big champions, they had to endure something it, that wasn't in their liking. There was always something that they had to persevere and they had to push through and there was always an adversity that they have to face in, in order to succeed. And, and I'm a true believer in that. So I think having that mentality helps me proceed with no matter what comes my way. But you just, even listening to you is inspirational because you, you seem Thanks. fearless. You seem, but no one is a hundred percent anything, right? Definitely. So what is, so what is your kryptonite? What gets you scared? What are you terrified of? I'd say I'm I'm scared all the time. I'm terrified all the time. For example, in the situation that we have right now, it's not easy. I don't have a big financial background of a help, and what what I have is what I work for. So it's definitely scary waking up and thinking that you don't have an income. But this is how I look at things. I always take things step by step. For example, before this, I had to wake up every day at 5 a.m. because my first client was at 6 a.m. And I, I still have that routine. So what I tell myself is, you just wake up at that time. You just put your shoes on. Hmm. You just leave the house. So I, I try to make everything in, in like smaller portions in order to be able to get myself through. Same thing when I want to go in the ring. I always say, just step in. And then I'm like, you just try to throw the first shot. Uh, you just go through this round. So I always try to make things smaller in in order to maybe reduce the stress or, or feel like it's attainable. But I wouldn't say that I'm not scared. I am scared, but I, I do feel that everything that comes my way is something that I can challenge and I can improve on. You sound like you have the focus and discipline of a champion athlete. <laughs> so, so, so if we're in the midst of this global pandemic, specifically with your sport, is there something, is there anything martial arts can teach us about dealing with crisis? Like what's the survival technique that you fall back on in martial arts in an adversarial position? I'd say perseverance and repetition for us is everything. We have that discipline to not care if something is continuously repeated. For example, now that I train other athletes and, and, and people, I see that they get bored easily and they want to move on to new things. What martial arts teaches you is that you need to be doing, I would actually say Bruce Lee's most famous quote. He says, I'm not afraid of a man who knows a thousand techniques. I'm afraid of a man who knows one technique, but has done it a thousand times. So we always say that in our Why training. is that important? Why is that repetition so powerful? It just makes you that much better. For example, when you go into the ring and it's a stressful time, 
you, not all of your senses are working perfectly as they would when you are training because you're in a stressful environment. Same scenario here. You would always fall back on a technique that you have done so much that you no longer have to consciously think about in order to throw. So basically what we think is when you repeat something so many times, you will be able to throw it unconsciously without having to put as much effort. And mm. that's the key in martial arts. You talked a, a couple of a minutes ago about uh, uh, financial vulnerability, and you're not alone. Like elite athletes who are not in one of the big sports, like the uh, are not an NBA player or a temp tennis champion, uh, seldom make bundles of money. What what mm -hmm. happens to an athlete who doesn't have millions in the bank in the time of Corona? What kind of conversations are you having with fellow athletes? So I would say in a sport like mine women never have made good enough money in order to be able to say, I'm a professional athlete and that's my job. Unfortunately for women, they have maybe over the past three to five years reached a place that they actually earn something from fighting. Before, they wouldn't even earn anything. And then in a sport like MMA, women are now making as much money as the men sometimes, more sometimes less, but in, not in all combat sports. For example, in boxing, women aren't making as much money to be able to afford a normal to low lifestyle. Same in kickboxing. So I've never expected my sport to provide an income for me. I always knew that I have to do something else. My university degree is in uh, applied mathematics. So I, I was looking into getting into programming. Uh, it wasn't my interest. Coaching was more of a calling for me. So even when I was fighting, I was still doing personal training. I was still teaching classes. And that was always my main income, well, I would say is. So now my what I would say to a fellow athlete is even though you should always respect that physical health and work on your training and keep yourself fit, it's good for your sanity. It, it keeps you going. But we always have to find a way in order to survive. I, I can't say this is the time that any of us could actually benefit from, but it's a time of survival. Do you for think, example, that, do you think I, the government should be doing anything in this moment specifically to protect or financially support our best athletes, our pe people like you? Because I come from a place that women had almost zero respect and human lives had no value. And I still have family back there, so I know, still know the situation there. When the government of Canada offers a minimum amount in order for people to be able to afford living for the next three, four months, and then on top of that, I can do my virtual sessions to be able to keep us going. And then we are, we are so lucky to, because Canadians are, I feel like they are the nicest people. For example, my landlord is charging half of the rent until I, I'm back on my feet. So all of these little things that people are doing to help each other will keep us going, and then we'll figure it out when it's done. But realistically looking at it, I don't think a government can afford paying extra attention to their athletes when their main people, the doctors, the nurses, the grocery staff are putting their lives in order to uh, help people stay That's alive. It's really noble of you, very nice son. No, no one, <laughs> no, really, no one would blame you if you were to say, "Hey, we need some, you know, we need we need a special dispensation of some kind right now." So, I appreciate you saying that. I also, by the way, I love that you got a math degree. Like you, can, you can take the 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 woman out of Iran, but, but she's still the first girl. <laughs> Baba oh, yeah. get after the she got you. <laughs> Even that's when you're exactly a champion true. kickboxer, you still I have to become I've an actually, engineer. You know? Every time I do a, a talk, the first thing I say is, "My mom was like, okay." You want to do sports, that's a hobby. If <laughs> right, you don't right, get a degree, course. you'll become a ham mod. Right, right, and right. for people who don't know what ham mod is, is a, is a low-level construction worker. So for her, it was either a degree or you lose. <laughs> Listen, let me ask you about, uh, this might be a strange question, but I know that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm guessing intuitively there's so much you love about Iran and the people and the culture and your family and the background, and yet you are correctly uh, critical of what things to be critical of and, and of what's happened to you personally in your story. Tell me about navigating that line 
for non-Iranians, right? Where you don't, I mean, a lot of people who might be listening to this who are Iranian are going to get it all. But for somebody who knows very little about Iran and, and your, 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 the, the things that you might say are critical enough that they will only walk away with some stereotypical critical notion, or um, do, you, do you worry about that at all? I mostly try to be myself. I know I'm a Iranian woman. I'm proud of my heritage, and uh, I look like a typical Iranian woman. And I say that with pride, and and I do appreciate what it has given me. And the adversities that I faced have created the personality that I am today. And and the fact that I don't lose myself when when something like a pandemic comes along, even though it is quite scary. But I feel like there's always going to be an end and there's always going to be uh, something better coming. I think that comes from what I have faced. So that's what I appreciate uh, from Iran and the people and the love, of course. But I don't shy away from saying the all the things that I had to endure. And I feel like the people who know me and the people who listen to me, they appreciate the honesty. So when I reach the point that I could actually comment about these things and I knew my voice was being heard. I was mostly thinking about the next generation, the women that are coming, because there are so many more women still in Iran that are far better than me, younger, in different sports, older, doesn't matter. Just as a sidebar, we've uh, have you seen those viral videos of Iranians, men and women, working out together on their balconies, following the moves of a trainer, mm. and they're keeping. Oh no, I haven't. Oh yeah, no, they're in these complexes. They're they're keeping safely away from each other, but they're engaging in this collective like co-ed exercises. And I, so I was oh. almost thinking, like, can the pandemic ironically break down some of the conservative taboos, you know, in Iranian society? Yeah, because in Iran, there is no way a man and a woman can be under the same roof if they're not somehow related. So on that note, and before I, I let you go, you have become this inspiration, this this role model for many young Iranian women who aspire to break the mold in their uh, their own individual ways. What What is your message to them? I would always say, do whatever you can and try to be the best version of yourself and the results will come. It might not come when we want it or how we want it, but it'll, it will eventually come uh, with perseverance. Fair enough. It's been such a, a, a such a, an honor, a pleasure to speak to you, and uh, we look forward to seeing you back in the ring. Thank you. Thanks, Fair enough. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Farinaz Lari, currently the 52-kilogram number five ranked contender in kickboxing in the world. You must visit her gym when in Vancouver. Farinaz joined us from Vancouver, Canada. This is a special themed episode of Rook the Champions. Uh, remember to uh, find all things about Rook. Our website is rookmedia.com where you can see previous episodes, all of our guests, clips, videos, everything is there. And you can become a patron at rookmedia.com by pressing the support us button. We also appreciate you uh, subscribing. Uh, whenever you can, wherever you can, on any of our platforms. Uh, once again, our main website, rookmedia.com. Well, we've heard from Fainoz Lari. Let's get to the second of our three champions on this special themed episode of Rook. Anyone who ever suggested in some antiquated or chauvinistic way that women are not, quote unquote, tough enough for martial arts has probably not witnessed the sporting career of our next guest today. Nassim Voraste is an Iranian-Canadian athlete who's carved out the moniker of Karate Queen for herself in what has been a traditionally male-dominated sport. She is the most accomplished Canadian karateka in the history of the sport and one of the most respected karate coaches in the world. With 12 silver medals in world championships and five Pan American titles under her belt, she is a second Dan Karate legend who has had an extensively thriving career as a competitor. She also happens to be the daughter of Dr. Fadhad Vorastea, the man who was 
the pioneering founder of karate in Iran, a sport that's become very popular amongst Iranians, as you may know. Nassim is a 12-time national champion for Canada, who is also a highly successful sport club owner and instructor and has worked alongside Karate Canada's national teams. She has been the recipient of numerous awards through the years, including the Karate Ontario Sportsmanship Award, three consecutive years as Karate Ontario Female Athlete of the Year, the National Karate Association Sportsmanship Award, the elected Canadian Olympic Committee Athlete Representative for Karate, and the Women's Team Captain for the National Team. She was also one of two athlete role models in the Youth Olympic Games in Buenos Aires in 2018. Nassim is a mother of two who was born in Iran, moved to Canada when she was six years old. She's currently the National Team Head Coach for Karate Canada and the only female head coach of a combat sport in Canada, and she's taken the Canadian team to the 2021 Tokyo Olympics. Nassim Voraste joins me in the Rook studio. Hello. Hello. Very <laughs> nice to have you here. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's exhausting reading your accomplishments. You did really well. <laughs> there's there's too really many, good. and I left a lot of them aside. That's I didn't okay. go through all the well, awards. Well, you, you pretty much got the main ones. I so. got the gist of it. Yeah. You know, I, I, what I really appreciate about you despite the fact that you were actually born in Iran, is that I, I think your Farsi is actually worse than mine. It's, yani, in gadar ke man bad hasta, to asan bad tar hasti, I think. You should have seen how bad I was a few years ago. <laughs> like, I think you would have cried for me, so. <laughs> uh, and I think my latcha is better than yours. That's what I'm running with, anyway. <laughs> sure. Listen, I've heard you say that you've often avoided doing interviews, that you're kind of shy when it comes to doing interviews, which really surprised me. Uh, I'm sure I'm typecasting you here, but watching you do karate and knowing the kind of career that you've had that certainly takes a lot of stamina and, and confidence and perseverance and self-awareness, uh, it surprised me that you were shy about interviews. I've learned to come out of my shell in these last couple of years. I have this discussion with my husband all the time. He's like, how come you don't take these opportunities on? How come How come when you're asked, you uh, decline? And I'm like, I don't know. I feel like it just doesn't suit my character, but I feel more and more that people want to know my story. And and I'm and I'm slowly opening up to it. So what was it about? Why? Why would you be shy about it? Um, really? I don't know. I've always been an introvert. I've always been a very private person. I've always been a very quiet person. Um, I've never boasted about my accomplishments when I was in high school and, and in university is like I could have been achieving everything that I was. I was national champion and nobody even knew about it. You know? Really? I was, see, I was going to get to that. Yeah. I, I was wondering if we, while you were at York, people know that you're this karate champion. Well, it got out, but it didn't get out through me. <laughs> it always got out through my friends or somebody said something or, you know, I'm, my friends were always very proud of me. So they would always end up introducing me as so-and-so and I would be like hitting them in the side. I'd be like, stop it, stop it. Have there been situations where you, I mean, not now, that where, you know, you'd be in your 20s with your friends at a bar and your friends would go, she's actually a karate champion. And, and then people would come over and clearly want to talk to you. Uh, how, how would you deal with that yeah, as an introvert? I mean, I mean, it was just so embarrassing. I would just like <laughs> turn every shade of red and just like <laughs> cover my face. And eventually, I mean, people ask and they're interested and you have to engage. You have to talk about it. Do you think people find it alluring? I think people are always curious when you're a unique character, somebody who is not typical. So, of course, I think there's definitely some sort of allure to it. Uh, I want to get into your story um, that I'm grateful that we get to do an interview to hear about. But um, let me start with karate. There's something mystical, kind of romantic notion around um, traditional martial arts and, and, and combat sports, you know, that that there are important values imbued in it, like discipline and focus and respect and honor, um, that you would somehow take those values and apply them in your life if you are practicing regularly. Is that a bit of a myth or is that actually true? I think it's I mean, for me, it is very true because it's something that my father was very always he, he was always very um, insistent on that. And he always pushed that um, in the class with all of his students. Um, so it's something that I believe that I 
practice um, and I hope I do and I hope that I reflect that um, but you know in sport it's different I mean karate has only become a sport in the last let's say 50 years so I find that more as we have become part of part of the sport and sport and Olympic movement there's this growing disconnection between um, between the martial arts spirit and between the sport a disconnect that you lament that I don't necessarily like, but mm-hmm. I think it's it's just a natural natural byproduct. But something like respect and honor. I mean, how how does that transfer from? You said it it work. It's something that has occurred in your life that you've taken that outside of your training and your competing. And how does it manifest itself? I think in our daily interactions with everybody, you know, and just and just how you view the world, how you view others, regardless of their skin tone, of their background, of their of their career, of of uh, whatever you do, it's 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 how you treat others, it's how you view yourself. And you teach that while you're teaching karate. Absolutely, absolutely, we do. I mean. It's how we we behave with the students. It's how we ask them to treat each other during class. And you know, the students have to bow to the instructors. The instructors have to bow to the students. The students have to bow to each other. And there's this etiquette that is strictly enforced in the class. And you know, when the kids are in it or the students are in it long enough, and they actually, it creates a very, very nice balance and harmony in the class, regardless of the fact that if we're sparring or if, you know, sometimes things can get a bit competitive, but at the same time, you always bow at the end. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? That, uh, I mean, I know this is probably a naive thing to say. People who are very involved in martial arts really hate me for saying this, but it is on the face of it, it's fighting. I mean, it's sparring. And for, so for that sport, from that to emerge respect and honor, as opposed to hockey or basketball or something uh is is interesting sparring is just one small part of the picture and i think it's just it's the part that is most interesting for people outside of the martial art is they focus on the combat and on the act of combat but in in reality it just it it represents a very small part of your actual practice of martial arts so i want to get into your story nasim let me start with a quote okay excellence is not an act but a habit. Aristotle. What can you tell me about that quote? Who taught you that quote? My father taught me that quote. Tell, tell us about your dad. Wow. So many people would say that I've actually inherited quite a bit from my father in terms of like how we, how we are. Um, he was a very kind man. He was funny as hell like i i always got a kick out of his humor it was very witty um he was very honest i mean that's i mean it was one of his strengths and probably one of his his weaknesses was that he was always honest um if he didn't like you you knew that he didn't like you (laughs) you know um he was a very good teacher he knew how to approach teaching differently depending on the student um, I should note, I mean, I did in the intro, but that, that he is, he's a legend for bringing karate to Iran, yes, right? Yes, yes. So where did he get that from? So that's another story. So um, he was in boarding school in England as a small boy, and he decided one day to pick on this Japanese boy, and he ended up getting beat up by this small little Japanese kid. And he was like, what was that? I've never seen anybody <laughs> do that. And the kid was like, oh, I do karate. And it wasn't like something that was widely practiced um, at the time. And uh, he became interested and he took up karate and my grandfather was sending him to Japan to learn karate. So he actually used to travel to Japan um, to learn this martial art that he'd become so fascinated with. And he was learning karate as he was doing his studies in, in Europe and Geneva, so. And so by the time you're born, he's a legend in karate. Yeah. um, And, you know, he was working in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the time. Um, Karate was not something that he ever um, planned on making his career. It was just it just simply happened because he brought this this new martial art, this new thing to a country where everybody just very quickly just became fascinated 
It it sort of follows somebody who is the progeny, somebody who's the kid of someone who's been so successful in one particular area. Reshte, you know, it, 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 you, you, there's this expectation. Well, of course, but is that true? Was it? Were you destined to be a karate kid? I don't know. I mean, like, had I been born in a different family, I'm not sure I would have gone this path necessarily. I think I was naturally inclined to be competitive and to pursue a sport absolutely i think i had i was always rough and tumble when i was a little girl i was like i don't know tackling kids in the soccer field and just like it was like i didn't know soccer without tackling like what do you mean you can't talk tackle in soccer do you do you think he wanted you to go into karate this is this is i mean i have two i have two older sisters who we were free to pursue it. Like, I want to say that. Like, he encouraged us to stay in it just to learn self-defense and to be active. Um, but, but he wasn't pushing it on you. He he didn't push it on them as much, but I feel like he pushed it on me a little bit more <laughs> just because I feel like he saw my potential and he saw that maybe there was something there so that he 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 recognized the spark in me. So he he definitely nurtured it. A and when was more. the moment when you knew that this is something that had engulfed you, that you had such a passion for? I actually hated it when I started it. You did? So, yeah, I, I started when I was six. I hated it all the way until I was 12. And, um, huh. yeah, and then when I was 12, I 12 or 13, I had my first competition, and I went and I just smoked everyone. <laughs> And then I was like, oh, I kind of like this. <laughs> and then that's when it all started for me. Really? Yeah. So, wow. So you spent a few years n not being so happy about being in, in, in karate. Yeah. I mean, my that's father. That's incredible because, you know, the, 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 the traditional story, you know, Pele or Gretzky or something, it's like, well, I, I, as soon as I was on the ice, I knew that that was my dream forever, you mm -hmm. know. And so to hear someone who's ascended to the heights that you have in a sport say, actually, I wasn't that hot on it for the first few years is really interesting. Yeah, I think, number one, my, my father having been my coach, he was always tougher on me than he was on all the other kids in class. And he always had very high expectations of me. Like, if I didn't work hard enough, I definitely heard about it, the drive home. Um, and I, I think it was that it was that feeling that he, ha he was harder on me, that I may not have liked it as much. Um, he always made me spar with like some of the stronger boys and stuff like that and I would get hurt sometimes so but when I saw that when I went to my first competition and I just I blew everybody up. yeah I, I cleaned <laughs> up and I had a lot of fun doing it and and I was just kind of like you know what I could do a little more of this so I want to get into your competitive streak but but let, but first you've said that I mean he wanted you to be number one yes right? yeah that's great you know, come on, you can do it. But it's also uh, a little worrisome. You know, that's a lot to put on a kid, especially when you're, you're, you know, that your dad is is someone who people who people have looked up to in this sport. How do you feel about the fact that he wanted you to be number one? I think it was good for me. Um, I think it allowed me to set the standards very high. Um, but I think it's very different than what we're doing now as coaches with kids. We just encourage them to go have fun and don't worry about everything and just do it. And I think, you know, that's something that we brought back from us from our from our Iranian culture is that we have that in our culture. We allow ourselves as as, as parents to to verbalize our very clear expectations to our kids and say, you know what, if you're going to do something, go and just if you're going to do it, go and be great at it. So. But see, my my dad was like that with me too, and uh, and if it's such a great thing, then why wouldn't we want to do it? Why wouldn't you be practicing that with your younger students or with your kids? Yeah, I mean, in other words, you know that there's something about it that that can be troublesome. I don't think it's something you can say to just anybody. I think you need to recognize the talent. Number one, you need to recognize that this individual has the willingness to to attempt to reach these heights so it's not just some some you cannot mindlessly throw your expectations out you you'd never definitely need to put some thought into it but when you know that you have a pupil who is determined who has a work ethic and who has the talent i think when you say that you know you can be number one it's actually very 
empowering. You know, I want to ask you about being Iranian because you, you left at a very early age with your family. But you, you're so Iranian in so many ways. You know, when you were on that TV program and they were going through your house, I was like, that's an Iranian's house. You know, yeah. it's uh, and, and did, did, did you self-identify as Iranian growing up in Canada? Did, did you ever feel like a, an outsider the, the way I certainly did when, I, when we were growing up or, or was it generally comfortable for you? I left when I was three months old. Yes. Um, my Farsi was terrible always growing up, but you know, it's like when you're living with your family, when I was always with my father, um, it's the values that were handed down to me. Um, all of my friends were Iranian growing up for the most part. Not all, but I would say majority of them. Um, of course, it's been a big part of my my life and and who I am. Um, and I think it's it's been quite defining actually, like in, in terms of, I feel like I'm, it's given me strength. Oh, how's it given you strength to be Iranian? Um, you know, I think as a people, we're very proud and we are always, we're quite ambitious mm -hmm. um and we're not a, we're we're not afraid to verbalize those expectations to our to our children and i think that that was always important for me growing up was the fact that my father always said to me like i expect you to be the best and it was because he believed that i could mm. but i think maybe if i don't know if we were from a different culture or whatever it 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 would have been different. I think it was a, a cultural expectation, maybe, or maybe it was just the fact that he was able to to uh, verbalize it. But all of this being said, I mean, I stopped training with my dad at 18 because the pressure was just too much. Hmm. And, and I turned around and I told him, like, I would rather have you as my father than as my coach. And he accepted, you know. But something that's really nice to see is despite the fact that you're a girl, I mean, after you, you, you leave Iran at three months old, you go to France first, right, for a few years? And and then Canada, is that the? Yeah, so we escaped through the mountains. Um, we went to Turkey, and then from there we went to Paris. Oh, you, you guys escaped? Yeah, we escaped. Because your dad was uh, he needed was, to. Yeah, because yeah. he was working in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs under the Shah's regime, so he was affiliated with the Shah at the right. time. So that was enough to get him imprisoned for several months. And then after that, he... Before you were born? Um, or as you were born? This is like it's pretty much as I was born. Right. Because wow. I was only three months old when wow. when when uh, we left. And we, we ended up having to flee through the mountains. And we left with nothing except for the clothes on our backs. My father and four children and a wife. So, wow. yeah, so I mean, like, you know, having experienced, like, I, I don't remember that experience, but I mean, having known that this, this was your past, um, that your father had everything, he was educated, he had his, his world, and then we pretty much left and we started with nothing, you know, yeah. you, you feel when you're growing up that I have to do something, and if I'm going to do something, I'm going to absolutely apply myself. I, I said I want to come back to you being competitive. How how important are the the awards that you've received to you? Uh, I, I mean, I know the one thing that has eluded you through no fault of your own because it wasn't an Olympic sport until recently is an Olympic medal. Is it really important to you, or or can you be satisfied with being as successful as you've been? It was never important to me because if it was, I think I would have quit a long time ago. Like I, I would not have been driven as an athlete if my, if, if one of my priorities was to be recognized as an athlete. Um, number one, at the time, um, we weren't an Olympic sport, and so the government funding was a lot less. Um, for, I mean, I would say the first few years of my my years as an athlete on the national team, I was self funded. Like we had to pay for ourselves to travel to represent Canada. Like as crazy as it sounds, but this is you have true. to run around looking for sponsors. Absolutely, and, yeah. but I mean, this is not just true for our sport, but true for almost all of the national sports. Right. Um, and then when I achieved um, my first, I think it was my silver gold medal at the Pan Ams, and I became carded, and that's when the government starts to to give you money, like basically having a salary. And they were also paying for my uh, university tuition. And that was like, that was a huge break for me. So after 
I would say my first few years on the national team. After that, I became carded and I was carded for about six years. What does it mean to you to be the Canadian national team coach? I mean, it's a great honor. I don't know. It's it's just been a really great experience, you know, and I'm so happy that my daughter can see that I'm that I'm in this position and I and I know that she's she's really proud of me and what, that makes me happy. <laughs> what do you what do you learn by being a coach rather than being the the player? Wow, it's so much more difficult to be a coach. It's funny. I mean, it sometimes is, huh? sometimes when I'm at a world championships and I'm just running everywhere you know you have to make sure everybody's healthy everybody's weight is good and everybody's weighed in and everybody's registered and everybody's where they should be and everybody knows what time they're competing and then sometimes you have to deal with like family and friends and then you have to deal with some political stuff that's happening Mm -hmm. there is just so much that you have to take on at a big event And it was just so much easier as an athlete when you can just focus on yourself, you go in your bubble and you just, you know, especially as a more seasoned athlete where you understand the routine and you're not like worried and intimidated by, by the name of an event. Oh, it's an Olympic games. Oh, you've got one job to do. Absolutely. But as a coach, it's in, and as a coach, you have to take on everybody's pressure. You know, you have to take on everybody's stress and it's, it's, it's a completely different it's a completely different experience and it's exhausting. Like I will come home from the world championships and I just feel like I'm in pieces. I'm exhausted, you know. Um, you, you've mentioned uh, weight a few times. You know, you have to make sure that people have a certain weight and because that's important in competing, you're in weight classes, right? Yeah. So <laughs> it's not a question I thought I was gonna ask, but does it, does it are you really disciplined about, I mean, if we come to your house for a mamoni, <laughs> Do we get portions of game oh, like God, you know no. you're not allowed to have very much because you have to stay in your weight class? You know? No, absolutely not. I mean, even when I was an athlete and I was competing, I was always at my comfortable weight. I mean, there's there's some athletes on the national team who have to do like pretty big weight cuts going into competition, and it's exhausting. Like especially mm-hmm. in those last 24 hours when they cut their water and they're depleted. Oh my God! Yeah, and it's just like you just got to make sure that like everything is going well because you know when you travel and you're in Europe or you're in you're in Asia and all of a sudden you know jet lag, long flight, no food, no water. It's right. just like, it, it, I mean, you, you you we really have to be there to support the athletes. Do you still eat rice and bread? I love it. Of course. So that's okay. We can still eat that. Yeah. <laughs> I love bread and rice. <laughs> of I, course. I feel like that's my. I that's my the bane of my existence. I can't stop. <laughs> you know, you can't take the bread. I can't stop eating the. If I I know that if I if I ate less rice and bread, I could be. I I wouldn't. You know, I wouldn't have to. I'd just be naturally lean. I wouldn't have to go to the gym all the time. Yeah, but, but then you would take away one of life's many pleasures. A hundred percent. And that's, I mean, if you're a foodie, you're a foodie, so. You know, I'm, I was thinking about your your trajectory and your father and your role model and your inspiration that he was. And and um, you lost your dad in March 2015. It was just a, I know what that could be like because I lost my dad five months earlier. Um, tell me about how losing him affected you. Oh, that's a tough one because it affected me in so many ways. But I would say one thing that came out of that was I think I became uncompromising in some ways. I wanted to live life in a way that made me happy. There was one moment when I was at the hospital with my father and it was like in one of his last days and I asked him if he had any regrets and he said many and it was like you know I was at the hospital with my dad and he he wasn't and we often spoke I mean he and I were very chatty with each other we we spoke of politics we spoke of 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 everything um and then so I was there with him and he was just he was there and I was there and and he wasn't talking. But I could tell, like he wasn't sleeping, but I could tell there was so much going on in his mind. And I just, it was one thing that I wanted to know. I just wanted to know if he had regrets. And I didn't ask him what they were, it didn't matter. And he said many. And I decided 
at that moment that I want to live my life in such a way that I have none. So, I mean, when I lost him, that was just like, I just told myself that, you know, we had that conversation and I just like, that's something that I really took away from it. I've heard that you actually had an offer to teach in Iran. Yeah. Um, I had that took been, a lot out of you, didn't it? Talking about your dad like that. No, I mean, it's funny because we had that conversation and, you know, I had to go to a national team training camp. Hmm. And I knew, you know, like at that time he was very ill. And I knew that if I go to this camp, I may not see him again. Yeah. And then I think that was one of the last days I saw him. I saw him maybe once after that. What was he? What was he suffering from? He had he had cancer, mm. and um, and he was very weak in those last days. And I went to camp, and I went to the training camp. And then they called me when I was at the training camp, and and they said that your father's probably not going to be with us for much longer. You need to come to the hospital now. And I left the camp, and I was driving to the hospital and I didn't make it in time. I was just a few minutes late. Anyway, so I mean that that last conversation that I had with him was it was it was important to me. Yeah. It was important. What was that last question you had? Hmm. I feel like I kind of went back. It's okay. No, 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 no it was important. Uh, no, I was asking about uh um I had heard that you had this opportunity this year or recently to actually teach in Iran and that was something that had interested you and I was sort of going to end with where you're going now with things. Um, yeah, so I have been asked to, like I would say for the last like eight years or so, I've been asked to go and do seminars and to teach and to run clinics. In um, Iran? Yeah, because there's like thousands of girls practicing karate, like so many more than there are here. Um, it's It's such a big sport. It's such a big sport in Iran. So, are they? Is there a dress code, or what? What are they? Yeah, allowed I mean, to do in Iran. Is it? Um, the girls have to wear the head coverings when they compete. Um, so, I, are there are the head coverings a, a disadvantage in competition? I would imagine it's uh, it's yeah. uncomfortable. You, have you ever tried it? No, no, no. Oh, I haven't tried it, yeah. but I mean, sometimes I see the girls having to sew it to their heads just because sometimes, oh sometimes yeah. in a clinch, you know, in, or or in, a, in in the middle of a throw, you know, all of a sudden the the they sew the scarf. they sew the headscarf to their head. Yeah, so they sew it to their hair. So to they make hair. a ponytail and then you just run it through their. Yeah, I mean it's just like yeah. it's it's uncomfortable, I'm sure. And but I mean they they uh, don't have a choice. I was actually speaking with somebody earlier, and you know some some of the other Muslim countries like Egypt and Morocco, it's it's optional. The girls there are girls on the national team who wear it, and there's others who don't, and they're free to do so. And with the Iranians, it's completely different. Um, so, but but I've been asked to to do seminars, to run clinics. It's it's been on the table for I'd say the last eight years or so. But this last this past year, they actually asked me to go and coach their female national team, and we were in serious discussions. Wow. Yeah. So I mean, like it was something I was strongly considering, um, just because I feel like, you know, what a great end to like I. I have been committed to the Canadian national team and but it was just it would be it would be such a nice way to honor my father's legacy and his life's work. Mm -hmm. If I was to go and finish my coaching career in coaching the Iranian national team, I think it would just wrap things up so perfectly. Um, so we were in discussions and at, and then it's like everything just happened with the killing of the Iranian general and then the the shooting down of the Ukrainian jet and right. and then COVID. COVID so it just yeah, seems yeah. like everything just fell through the cracks. Um, but so it's something you're open to, huh? It was. I think the situation is very different now. Like um, meaning you would move to Iran? I would have moved for the contract. Like I, I, I would have moved for those for those months. Mm. And I mean, when you know that you're away, of course it's difficult for me to be away from, from my family, from my right. children. But when you know that it's for a defined period of six months and you need to endure, it's like you commit to something and you go. I mean, regardless of when you accept the circumstances, then you accept it. How do you define success now, Nassim? I mean, if you have accolades and achievements and you're not content and you're not happy, then you haven't achieved success. I think it's when you are at peace with with yourself 
it's when you are happy um when you're alone and nobody's watching and i can honestly say that i am i'm i'm happy with the decisions i've made in my life with my career path with how with how i interact with others with with how i treat with, with how i treat others with how i view myself so i think that's a big part of being successful is you know not just how the public perceives you and and all the titles you can have under your belt it's it's also how i feel when i'm just me myself and i hmm. so yeah. thank you for doing this today it's been my pleasure thank you nasim varaste karate champion the current national team coach of the canadian team who has led them to the uh, tokyo olympics nasim varaste join us in the Rook Studio. This is a special themed episode of Rook as we're doing all month. This one, The Champions. Uh, remember, uh, to find all things Rook, you can go to our rookmedia.com website, rookmedia.com, where all of our previous episodes are, video clips, um, guests, what else? Should I have? Music, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. all there. Rook Funnies and all this. Rook Funnies, yes. uh, rookmedia.com. I'm remembering um, that bringing on champions is a way of just feeling uh, shitty about ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> These people are incredibly impressive. Uh, let's get to our third guest and the third uh, person on this Champions episode of Rook, a true pioneer of women's wrestling in the United States and beyond, a former champion who was the first world medalist in women's wrestling back in 1989. Afsun Roshan Zamir Johnston was born in Tehran in the early 70s. Her father was a successful wrestler who taught her the moves at their home while she was growing up in Iran. At the age of 11, in the aftermath of the revolution and amidst the Iran-Iraq war, Afsun Afsun and her family moved to Northern California. This was around 1984. Afsun attended Independence High School, a school known for its state championships in wrestling. There she became the first and only girl wrestler on both her high school and college teams. Afsun made her USA national team debut while she was still in high school. At the 1989 World Championships held in Switzerland, Afsun was the first American woman to win a world medal for the U.S. in women's freestyle wrestling. She went on to become a multiple national champion and a two-time world medalist while also earning her master's degree in physical therapy. Afsun has in recent years coached the U.S. women's team at many world championships and was awarded Coach of the Year by USA Wrestling. She coached Team USA at the 2016 Olympics in Rio, and that team won the Olympic gold with her at the helm. She has been inducted into the California Wrestling Hall of Fame and received the Lifetime Achievement Award, and she currently still coaches and resides in San Diego, California with her husband and three children. She is the subject of a new biography of her life written by Craig Sesker entitled simply Afsoon and right now Afsoon Roshan Zamir Johnston joins me from San Diego hello well hello and thank you so very much for having me on your show today it's a great pleasure to have you on congratulations champ oh thank you thank you I mean what you have done is it's truly remarkable. I, I am in awe of the fortitude it must have taken for a new immigrant girl to go into wrestling and beat the boys in the 1980s. <laughs> and I want to get into your story. But first, you know, you yes. are an American legend of the sport now. You've won Olympic gold with Team USA. But on your Instagram, you're listed as Iranian. Tell me about being bicultural and being claimed by two countries. Yes, absolutely. You know, us Iranians um, are very, very proud of our culture and our heritage. Of course, I'm Iranian. I have Iranian blood running through me. As an Iranian, we went through some hard times and um, 
you know, my family had to immigrate into the United States and um, being an immigrant is is tough. And um, as an 11 year old coming from Iran during that time period, uh, it, it was a challenge. It was it was tough. But for me, uh, I found my voice and I found my identity um, and I found how to belong in this new country and new culture uh, through wrestling. So that was my journey in into really survival and, and assimilating and, and becoming an Iranian American and being successful in this new country. But of course, I'm, I'm always be Iranian. Uh, you know, something I think is really um, fun is is uh, Jaleb <laughs> is <laughs> is that you're just being discovered by Iranians, which must be some sort of uh, of entertainment for you, given that you actually grew up in Iran. I mean, you're mostly known as Afsun Johnston, and and I think back to when you won that first world medal in 1989. There was no social media for people to discover your roots at a, at a you know on a, on a keyboard. I mean, I understand it was. It was actually when you won this 2016 gold as coach of Team USA that a lot of Iranians right. came to find out that you're also one of us too. What what is yes. it like to be just getting known <laughs> by your ancestral peeps after all these years? Right, right. No, it's it's really fun and it's really neat. Um, I'll tell you a couple of stories that kind of um is interesting and to your point where I I think I'm just now being discovered. But you know, times have also changed. I don't know uh, how I would have been. Accepted, how much I would have been accepted as an as an Iranian woman wrestling, um, you know, back when I was wrestling in 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 the early eighties. And um, I remember at the first World Championships that I attended, it was in Martinique, Switzerland, and for the first time ever historically, United States was sending a women's uh, wrestling team, and it was the first historic World Championships. With that included women for women, right. I remember, of course, you know, having to represent United States, but being um, there as a as an athlete at the World Championships with USA um, on my singlet on my warm up, and um, I noticed that Team Iran wrestling was there. And of course, I got so excited and I was, you know, so proud thinking I'm going to go over and introduce myself and say I'm Iranian, but I'm, 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 I'm a woman, but I'm also a wrestler and Iranian, you know, Kushti is in our blood and, you know, thinking that everybody, you know, would be maybe proud of me for that. And so I remember approaching at the time, this is 1989, um, approaching the men's national um Iranian wrestling coach and saying, hi, my name is Afsun. I'm Iranian. I'm a wrestler. Mm -hmm. And um, the coach at the time told me, Hanum, um, I think it's great that you wrestle. Um, but at this time, we we can't watch you and we can't support you. Wow. And that was really devastating to me at the time thinking here is an accomplishment that I, I I'm a wrestler and I'm Iranian and I'm a woman and I'm you know a pioneer the first of doing this and I thought it would be something that maybe um, they would be proud of me right, you know the right. Iranian wrestling federation the men's team but the timing just wasn't right and I'll tell you another story so then recently so remember that story right and then just recently, after the 2016 Olympics, now we're going from 1989 to, you know, 2017. <laughs> right. Fast forward uh, 30 Fast years. Fast forward yeah. 30 years, exactly. And this is where, to my point where times have changed. I was at an international wrestling competition. And again, this time now I'm, I'm the U.S. coach, wrestling coach. And... Um, you know, I have my badge around my neck, my credentials, and it says, you know, Afsun, and it says, you know, Team USA. And and as I'm coaching um, this big international competition, um, the, it's the, the men and the women were wrestling at the same venue, same time, same place. And I see all the Iranian fans in the stands. And somehow word got out that, oh, you see that USA woman's coach? She's actually Iranian. Hmm. And so every time I walked out into the center stage, competition stage, with one of my USA athletes, not only was the USA section cheering, but the whole Iranian section oh, were cheering. Wow. 
It was so neat. And so it, it, and it, it's still telling you the story it gives me goosebumps, right? And so I remember just going into the stands and taking pictures with the Iranian oh, fans. Wow. And they're just welcoming me as one of their, their own, right? And, and like I said, even though it was USA competing, women's USA competing, the Iranian fans were still cheering because I, as an Iranian, was their coach. It's beautiful. And it was so neat. So then um, the wait, story wait, gets wait, wait, wait a second. It was, was the oh, where, was the American team confused? <laughs> like, why, why, no, why are was, the Iranian fans cheering for us? Or I guess they know well, at this point your, they your know, background. They know yeah. that I'm Iranian. And they thought it was really, really cool. The athletes loved it because not only do they have the American fans cheering for them, but now they have this whole other country, Iranian <laughs> That's great. fans cheering for That's them. Great. So they loved it. But this is where the story gets even better. Um, so again, we're in the back area, the warm up area, and I'm warming up my team, um, you know, be- before their, their matches. And, um, I look over and there is the Iranian men's national team. Right. And, uh, Rasul different, Fadem, different coach, I assume, at this point. Of course, because this is now 30 years right, later. Right. And, and so, but I remembered my experience of what had happened 30 years prior. And so I was gun shy. I didn't want to go over and introduce myself because I remember what had ha- happened 30 years prior. And so I, you know, from the corner of my eye, kind of kept an eye on the Iranian team. And again, being so proud that I am Iranian and that is my national team. And, and I wish that there was a woman's Iranian national team competing there, but it was the men's, you know national wrestling team competing right, right. and um so i went and, about and by the way business. just to set just to set this up for sure. any non-iranians who might be listening uh, koshti like re- wrestling is I, I guess i mean other than maybe football other than soccer is is pretty much the biggest sport in iran right i mean it's a very exactly. prominent sport yeah Yes, it's Kushti is, you know, our national sport, Kushti and football. So here we are in the backstage. I'm warming up Team USA Women's Wrestling and the Iranian men's national wrestling team is there. And um, lo and behold, the Iranian coach, Mr. Rasul Khadam, comes over and says, um, Hanum, um, lady, are, are you, you, you're, you're Afsun, right? And Right there, I was like, wow, he knows my name. He knows who I am. You know, I'm just like, you know, impressed by even that. And he said, um, can you come over with me for one moment, please? Um, and I and I thought, okay, sure. Yes, of Here course, this is Russell Pandem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, of course, I'm going to say yes, but I have no idea what he's, he's going to do or uh-huh. say to me. And so he takes me over to his team, the, the Iranian men's national wrestling team. And he said... Bachaha, my team, look at this lady. Look at this woman. Her name is Afsun. She is Iranian. She is the first world medalist in women's wrestling. It, even though it's for United States, it was for United States, she is Iranian. And I want you to look at her, and I want you to remember her, and I want you to give her medal her world medal and her uh, Afsun, the same respect that you would give to any male wrestler in our country, such as Tahti, such as any of our great male wrestlers that have medaled at the Olympics and world championships. This woman is pride of our country and you need to give her a recognition and the same respect as you would any male wrestler from our country. And that just blew me away. The fact that the Iranian men's national coach would say that and give me that respect and introduce me as such to his national team 30 years later. So, yes, it's great to have Iranian fans. So, wait, 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 wait. I mean, that is a – the way you set that up, is especially, that is just a – it's so profound and, and uh, poignant at the same time. Let me first say, I mean, as a kid, you know, you've just talked about how proud you are of your Iranian heritage and, and your lovely parents, um, but you yes. don't have great memories of revolutionary Iran before you guys left. I mean, you chronicle some harrowing scenes uh, yes. in your new biography, uh, especially when it comes to there's a scene with your aunt who I know ends up yes. spending a bunch of jail time. Uh, what, what can you tell us about your memories of, of that time before you end up coming to the United States? 
unfortunately, my memories of Iran during that time were of scary times, of of times of oppression and not um, not being able to to express myself and be who I am. And so, you know, in home in my home. My, my parents taught me differently. And my dad, because of his love of wrestling, you know, would, would teach me wrestling. And so growing up, I knew all the wrestling moves. I knew Fit to the Peach. And I knew, you know, all the great techniques of, of Iranian wrestling. Now, now your dad was a, a well-known wrestler in Iran, right? Yes, yes, he was. And uh, in some of his time, he wrestled in Europe. And what, what's his name? Manu Cher, Manu Cher Roshan Zamir. So yes, yeah, so that's what my father was, and that's what he taught me. And I thought that's what everybody did in their living room. You know, <laughs> it wasn't. Right. It wasn't until I went outside of the house and got older, and I thought, oh, okay, so this <laughs> this isn't a thing that everyone does at home. This is this is unique, and to me and my my family, me and my father. But outside of our home, and especially in Iran. Again, now fast forward to when we did come to United States, and again, I call it the land of opportunity for many different reasons. But for me, in that, coming to United States, yes, girls still didn't wrestle. But what girls did do is they did have opportunities. Right. They didn't, they weren't limited by, by law. Absent, John, at that age, do you, I mean, you don't know anything different because you've been living in your, I mean, obviously you remember the time before the revolution, even though you were a little, little, little kid, but did mm -hmm. you want to leave Iran or were you, was there fear, some fear associated with going to America too? I mean, what, what, what was your feeling at that time? That's as a, kid? a great question. That is a great question. And so to be honest, because at that time there was, it was such a dangerous time in Iran. My parents kept everything from me. They they didn't want to stress their child out with details that we were going to leave Iran and we're going to immigrate to a new country. And so, to be honest, they were doing a lot of things like, for example, selling the furniture at, at in my house. And initially, I didn't know why. I didn't hmm. know what was right. going on. And so, they only shared with me, it was maybe less than a month before we were actually going to leave the country that this was actually happening and that we were leaving Iran and, and immigrating to the United States. And so in school, I'm saying Marek Bar Amrika, death to United States. Right, right. And then all of a sudden at home, my parents are telling me, we're moving to United States. Right, and we're it's gonna a little confusing for a kid. It was yeah, very yeah. confusing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I did arrive to the United States, to California, and we settled in Northern California. That was the hardest time because, one, I didn't speak a single word of English. Nothing at all, two, huh? You didn't? You nothing didn't, oh. at all. Nothing at all. But two, I was this weird kid, you know, that dressed differently and looked different from a different country. And then the kids at school would ask me. Yeah. What country are you I was going to say, it's not just a different country. It's the country to, to just to take us back to the early 80s. It's the country yes. that has been, that the that the kids in America, you know, the mm -hmm. counterpoint to the kids in Iran screaming death to America, the kids in America have been taught this is the evil country that we're against, exactly. right? So, yeah. Exactly. Because it was right after the American hostage crisis that occurred in yeah. Iran. You know, this is all early 80s where the relationship between the United States and Iran was, was definitely n not good. And so, you know, kids are asking me, what where are you from? What nationality are you? And I, and I would proudly say, I'm Iranian, you know, and they would, they would in turn look at me and say, you're a terrorist. Get out of our country. Go back to your own country, you know, and. So this is the part of your story, I, I, sorry to cut you off, that the story of you coming to America and then becoming a star U.S. athlete, it, it, it's like a movie, uh, you know, you come in 84, you don't really speak the language, it's clear that, it'd be clear that you wouldn't really fit in at the time, it's not like Northern California is full of Iranians in that moment, there's a fateful turn when you decide you want to be on the high school wrestling team. Uh, the, mm -hmm. with the boys you're a new immigrant you're a girl w mm -hmm. where did you get the courage to believe you could do this or to even say this is hey guys include me mm -hmm. <laughs> right right well you know at that point it became survival mode right i knew i was good at sports 
And in particular, I was good at wrestling. But still, this is still early 80s. Girls still didn't wrestle, not even in the United States. And so I thought, okay, to do the all-American girl thing and the sporty thing, I need to reinvent myself. And so what do popular American girls in high school do? Well, they cheerleaders. Oh, what is a cheerleader? You know, I had no idea what a cheerleader even was, but I knew they were popular. So I was like, okay, well, that's what I'm going to do. And so I, I went out for the cheerleading team. And all of a sudden, I'm, you know, trading in my chador for this really short, short skirt and um, these pom pom looking things. And I'm jumping up and down and cheering for the boys, you know. And yeah, it brought me popularity, but it just wasn't me. So I'm at my high school. It's after school, and the wrestlers are waiting out the bo- you know, they're all boys. Of course, it's the boys' wrestling team. They're out- outside the, the wrestling room waiting for the coach to open up the wrestling room. And here I am walking past them, and I'm in my cheerleading outfit along with my friend who's also a cheerleader. And the captain of the wrestling team kind of starts teasing my friend and kind of, you know, just talking with her and whatever. And, you know, I don't know what made me do this. But I started speaking up and I said, hey, leave her alone. And he goes, oh, yeah, what are you going to do about it? And he's standing outside of the wrestling room on this grass area and he's standing in this perfect stance. And I don't know what triggered me in my mind, but I blasted him with a wrestling move we call a double leg. But I blasted him with this double leg and landed him right on his back in front of all the other wrestlers, you know? So you could imagine, here I am, a girl, freshman, in, in, you know, in her, rest, in her cheerleading outfit, taking down the captain of the wrestling team in front of the, the other wrestlers. Right. And everyone's like, oh, wow, whoa, she took him down. Wait, how do you know how to wrestle? They go, why don't you come out for our wrestling team? Of course, half jokingly, you know? But I didn't take it as a joke. I thought, why don't I? That's perfect for me because if I want to go out for the boys wrestling team, there's nothing that legally can stop me. The law is on my side. It's only three or four years later, uh, 1989, uh, those world championships we mentioned earlier in the interview in Switzerland, uh, Mm -hmm. you're still just a teen. You didn't mm-hmm. speak the language, you know, for, uh, four years earlier, five years earlier. What what did it mean to win that first women's medal uh, in in freestyle wrestling uh, and do it for the USA? I was just in awe. I was a teenager that all of a sudden I was on a world stage along with these you know, Olympic medal, male Olympic medalists, because you got to understand in 1989 World Championships, that was the first time ever they had women's World Championship wrestling. And so um, all along in high school, I had posters of these these famous wrestlers Mm. on my, you know, whereas most girls have posters of like, you know, singers or rock stars (laughs) or whatever. I had posters of these like wrestlers on on my wall, you know, these these famous um, wrestlers. And all of a sudden, I'm competing on the next wrestling mat next to them. I didn't realize the significance of it. And when I medaled at that world championships, I was, I was happy just to be having the opportunity and to be included and being allowed. You don't know you're a pioneer. The history has to happen for you to become a pioneer, right? You don't know you're a pioneer in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I had no idea. You know, I come back home and I'm taking my senior pictures for high school and everyone's going, what'd you do this summer? You know, we, we went to the beach and I'm like, well, I competed at the world championships. Well, well, let me ask you about that. I mean, you go on to win a number of championships and medals for America. Uh, I mean, you talk about how women's wrestling has changed. I think it's it's one of the fastest growing sports in the United States now for women. Yes. Women's wrestling is now an Olympic yes. sport, of course. It was not when you were competing in your prime. Do you lament that a sport that has become so popular for girls and for women now was not as big when you were dominating it and blazing the way forward? There is part of that. I I do. It is. It's bittersweet. It is definitely bittersweet because somebody had to start it, right? (laughs) So I'm really glad it was, it was me that I, I had a, a, you know, 
I had a part in starting it. But at the same time, yeah, I see my, the athletes that I'm coaching now, they have agents and they have social media, you know, to where the, the, they have all these sponsorships and they're recognized and, you know, and, and, and at that time, the only recognition I was getting at was, 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 you know, people going, what the heck are you doing? Are you crazy? Mm. You know, and so just now that I'm, I'm seeing the, the rewards of it. <laughs> what, what has it been like to morph into a coach? And what did it mean to win gold with Team USA in Rio five, four mm -hmm. years ago? It's come full circle for me because obviously when I first started wrestling, my goal was just for them to allow me to wrestle. And then I got into high school and my goal was, okay, I just want to beat the boys and I want to make varsity and, you know, accomplish that. And then my goal was, oh, okay, I'm on the national team now. I want to win the national championships and I want to win the world championships. And then my goal was, mm. Okay, so here's another lesson in things. Don't limit yourself, right? And your goals, um, set goals and, 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 and shoot, have dreams and shoot for it. And you never know how far it can take you. But so then my goal was the Olympics. You know, I want to compete in the Olympics. I want to become an Olympic gold medalist. And because I had started so young and I was a pioneer and I was, you know, the first to kind of start women's wrestling, women's wrestling did not get into the Olympics when I was still at my competing age. So I was waiting for the 2000 Olympics. So I was, I still had the number one ranking in the United States at that time. And uh, in 2000, I had just gotten married. Uh, I was holding off having kids because I wanted women's wrestling to debut in the Olympic Games. And I wanted to be the first Olympic medalist mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And so I put off having kids and my career as a physical therapist to still train and still compete in the hopes of competing in the 2000 Olympics. Well, women's wrestling did not debut in the 2000 Olympics, and they told us that it would debut in 2004 Olympics. So in 2000, I was at that crossroads. What do I do? Mm -hmm. Do I retire now at the top of my sport, at the top of my game and, you know, retire and go on into coaching and go on into um, being practicing physical therapy and and having my family? Or do I put all of that on hold for another four years with really no guarantees that it would become an right, Olympic sport right, in right. 2004? So at that time, I made the decision that I was going to retire and start my family. So I had my son in 2002. And then in 2004, I was pregnant with my daughter. And that's when women's wrestling debuted in the Olympics. So there I was nine months pregnant with my second child. And I'm watching on TV women's wrestling in the Olympics. Mm. And I just remember breaking down and becoming so emotional. I mean, you're emotional anyway when you're nine months pregnant, right? But then here, everything that I had hoped for and dreamt about and, you know, set a goal for to compete in the Olympics, and it just, the time was not for me. Right. I, right. you know, then I had my daughter and I took one look at her and I call her my Olympic gold medal mm. and I wouldn't change the anything but for me... And you didn't consider joining the team whilst nine months pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it. I I, you seem know. to be able to do anything. So, <laughs> <laughs> But so here's, here's where the story gets interesting. So yeah, that was always a void for me. That was always, you know, that itch that needs scratching that you mm. can't quite get to, right? It was something that just always bothered me that just always bugged me like i never competed in the olympics the olympics was always you know my my dream and i never it just that that itch was always there and i couldn't get to it to scratch it until i got back into it as a coach and now it's an olympic sport for women and i thought okay so now that's my goal is maybe i didn't get to compete in the olympics but gosh darn it i'm gonna go and get that olympic gold medal whether that means me having to coach someone to do it mm -hmm. <laughs> and sure enough and that's where we made history again by the united states getting that olympic gold medal 
in in the last Olympics when I when I was able to coach it. So yeah, I finally made my Olympic dream happen. A little bit different. It happened as a coach and not as a competitor. But regardless, I, I was able to fulfill that dream. And um, so that experience for me was very surreal and, and came full circle and closed the loop. Uh, it's your story is just uh, it, it really is. Uh, I mean, this book is going to get optioned to become a movie if anyone ha- has any sanity. It's it, I, it, you, I you can outdo so. Rocky for uh, <laughs> for great storylines just with, without even embellishing. Thank them. you, and that's been that's that's my hope and my dream. I hope that this story comes in front of maybe a successful Iranian American that that you know is in in the movie business and and because you know at one point they did buy an American production company did buy my story rights for a year and they they wrote a couple of different screenplays on it to make it into a movie and then unfortunately it it's still out there we're looking for a for a movie production company or or, an investment group or someone that believes in this story and that is willing and maybe has the way and the means to to turn it into a movie because that would be so amazing. It would be great for the Iranian American community. Yeah, the story is there, and it's and and the proof is you. You know, you you can. <laughs> uh, it's. Not, I mean, back to this bicultural idea that we started with. Before I let you go, um, I understand you've been. I'm, here's how much things have changed. I suppose, even though we, um, uh, many folks lament the situation in, uh, that continues in Iran uh, under the current uh, government and regime, but I understand you've been approached by Iran by the by the national team to become a coach. Yeah, you know, again, um, I, I'm I'm an Iranian American. I'm I'm always going to be Iranian, and so how amazing would it be for me to be able to to go back to Iran and and be able to coach and and teach Iranian women how to wrestle and so yes so Iran is starting a women's wrestling team again with a lot of limitations still um and like what maybe like a, they have to wear the rosari and they the, have to- only in um in gyms where it's only women right and um you know no men can be present and of course you know you can't have a male coach and uh there haven't been enough women wrestlers at at the level we need in order to coach the 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 women's iranian national team right and so i'm hoping that that's something that maybe will be in the future um it would be great. It would be my dream. Like that would be the ultimate dream for me, right? To have to see, to come from you know Iranian being of Iranian heritage to where you know my story in in, in America, but then actually to see yeah. how far women's wrestling has come t- in the United States. But then the ultimate thing to see women's wrestling in Iran. The sequel to the movie that. is the sequel to the movie, the Afsun Two. The sequel is that you win the gold <laughs> for the Iranian team as well. Oh my gosh, that gives me what? goosebumps! How amazing with that. What is your? Iran. What I know that there's Iranians who are aware of you now, and there's probably Iranian girls who follow you on social media now. I mean, what what is your advice to Iranian girls in Iran or, or beyond? Um, who follow you on social media or know your story and, and want to get involved and want to get into wrestling themselves? What would you say? Yeah, to them? it's been so great that so many have actually reached out to me either on my Facebook page, which is you know Afsoon Roshan Johnston, my Instagram Afsoon Wrestling. Um, this younger generation, I think, tends to reach out to me on Instagram. So yeah, my my Instagram um, page. At, Afsoon Wrestling has really blown up. But it's really cool because they'll send me messages and say, oh, I'm Iranian also. And, and you know, whether it's they're all over Europe um, and actually some that are still in Iran. But yeah, I've had a lot of not only girl wrestlers reach out to me, but actually fathers that are saying we want our daughters to wrestle and mm-hmm you know, we love your story and what advice would you give? And, and yeah, so I've given advice both to the parents, the fathers, you know, and allowing their girls to wrestle. And then it's been just so cool for these young girls that have reached out to me and say, I love wrestling. I want to wrestle. And, and so I do end up following them and encouraging them and giving them little like, so what is the advice in a a nutshell? What would you say? What is the advice?
advice to you know to, my big thing is is you know believe in yourself and follow your dreams like i never thought all of this was possible they told me i can't do it and i believed in myself no i can do this mm. and if it's something you love and it, you're passionate enough about don't let anybody stop you now wrestling is a tough sport like we talked about it is mm -hmm. a very challenging sport but if you love it definitely don't let anybody stop you and mm. f believe in yourself and follow your dreams I thought the advice was going to be randomly tackle the captain of the, uh, the wrestling team <laughs> on some grass outside of the school. <laughs> I know, but those moments like that, you would have never imagined happening. And it's funny, a little moment like that, that just changes the course of your yeah. lifetime and sets you on this crazy path. Hey, where and was your dad when you won the Olympic gold in 2016? What, what Was he uh, watching on TV? Was he in Rio? What did, what did yeah, so what happened was with the Olympics, see, people don't realize it, but we we had to be in Rio for the a whole month before our competition. We for the last four years prior to the Olympics, we had to we had to um, travel to different countries to qualify. There's a there's a lot of behind the scenes that's involved that you know people don't realize, and all you watch is the Olympics, but there's so much more that goes into it. So we were actually in Rio a month prior to the competition because we had to get acclimated we had to get used to the food the water like everything our sleep patterns our training um in that time zone everything so for a whole month before the olympics we were already in rio so my parents i love my parents they actually moved into my house and watched my three kids oh. and my house while I was in Rio. There's no way I could have done it right. without the support of my husband and my parents. So my parents actually moved into my house and so they were with my kids and yes, yeah, they watched it on TV and, you know, and I communicated with them, of course, but, um, but my husband joined me, um, in Rio the week before the Olympics. So it was my parents um, at my house with my kids watching it on TV, like everyone. Your, your parents must be so proud. Your dad, the, the wrestler himself, to see what you've done. Uh, it must be just such a joy for him. Yeah, well, you know, it was it was his decisions and his willingness and his open-mindedness that really ultimately, uh, you know, I was able to reach the success because of it. And the kids and your kids get uh, grandma's uh, cooking while you're gone, so everybody wins. They get the Persian. Yeah, my warm is definitely not as good as my mom's. <laughs> my kids are like, "You sure this is the same? This isn't the same thing Grandma makes." <laughs> mom's good at wrestling, but I don't know about her warm <laughs> Yeah, uh, it is a it's a great pleasure to talk to you. Uh, thank you for making the time. Thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for uh, for the community and and being such a role model. And uh, I can only imagine that um, you, you, there's more ahead in terms of uh, uh, someone who's broken so many barriers and who's um, set the bar high and continues to do so. I really appreciate it. I hope we get to meet you in person at some point and uh, um, I would see you in San Diego. Yeah, I would love as things open up to be able to do an in-person interview with you guys sometime. I, I really enjoyed my time being on your program, being on your show and talking with you some great questions and I had a great time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Well, I'll look forward to doing that again. Thank you for doing this. Take care. Good office. Good office. Afsun Roshan Zamir Johnston, an Iranian-American wrestler and wrestling coach uh, and a true pioneer of the sport around the world. The new biography about her is entitled Afsun, and it can be found at afsunwrestling.com. Afsunwrestling.com. Afsun Roshan Zamir Johnston joined us from San Diego, California today. This is full time for Rook. Thank you so much for listening to this special themed edition of Rook. We've got another one coming up this Thursday. The Broadcasters. Stick around for that. For all things Rook, you can go to our website, rookmedia.com. Rookmedia.com. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together each week. Producer Susan Ponta, the artist. Thoughtful Nagin, the fabulous Keon. Super Patty Saw, Savvy Roham, Ahai Merdod, Sponsorship Sean. 
Captain Reza, and of course, Groovy Shia. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us, sharing our content. Please subscribe if you have not done so already. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter at Gian Gomeshi. In the meantime, Mizunbashi. Bashi.